Hello friends, today I thought I'd talk a little bit about Dartmoor Prison. Uh, perversely, it was one of the favourite prisons of mine to go to, <laughs> if you can have a favourite. Uh, you know, anyone from the South West, uh, you, you always end up in Exeter prisons to start with, because uh, that's your remand prison, the place you go first. And then you normally get a slip under the door once you've been sentenced, and it tells you you're either going to sort of challenge Wood or, or Dartmoor. Now, everyone would want to go Channing's Wood. They seem to like it there. It's near Newton Abbott. Um, but perversely, I liked Dartmoor. Um, I don't know, there's something about the place. It was, It's what's known as a bird killer. And a bird being your time in prison. So it was always... The regime is just set up in a way that seems, you know, just to make the time go fast. And whereas at Exeter Prison, you kind of only are out yourself for maybe an hour or two a day if you're not working. At Dartmoor, you can be out all day. And you get association every night, and uh, you're only sort of locked up over meal times and things. So, yeah, it was uh, it was it was my choice of prison to go to all the time. And uh, like I say, perversely, I had some of the, the happiest times of my life there. Um, <laughs> as pathetic as that sounds. So today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, escape from Dartmoor Prison and the people who have escaped, and and my experiences with that. Now, the very first time I went to Dartmoor, um, we're looking at what 2003. I actually was there when people escaped. Um, it was a bit of a bodge job, um, but they, they, they managed it. They got over the wall. Um, I'll tell you how they did it. Um, one of the wings has an exercise yard, and it's a bit of a... It's just like a concrete yard, really. Some some exercise yards in prisons have got sort of, you know, uh, grassy patches and, you know, areas you can walk around and, you know, things to look at and do. Um, but this is just literally a fenced-off area outside the prison and uh outside the wing sorry and what the lads did is the benches weren't screwed down to the floor like you that you'd think they would be and the way the gate was set up um if you can imagine a gate you know normally they have the kind of the hook that goes on the fence and then on the gate you have an eye that goes over that hook and normally on most gates like farm gates and, and house gates that sort of thing you normally have like a bolt that goes on top of it so that you can't just lift the gate out now this gate, bearing in mind, is like the gate to the, the you know, the gate around the uh, the fence around the prison. Um, inside, you've got the walls that go around the out the exterior of the prison, and then maybe sort of ten or fifteen feet inside that wall, you've then got a metal fence. And on this, it, in, it, within this metal fence, was a gate um, that obviously has access to the wing, and you know you could get a lorry through and stuff. And this gate didn't have any bolts above the eyes on the hooks on the fence so these lads realized that if you got one of the benches and basically use the bench to lever the gate you could pop it off those hooks uh, the gate would then fall down and these lads used the bench that they just uh, taken from the exercise yard put it up against the wall and use that then to sort of climb up and, and get over the wall now bearing in mind that this wall is about 15 foot high uh about three three or four lads escaped from the exercise yard um got up over the wall uh, one of them jumped down and broke his ankles on the other side of the wall um so he didn't get far <laughs> but the other two or three lads they escaped and they were off for a few days and they eventually get caught um they made it off the moor and you know they, they got caught eventually but you know most people don't even make it off the moor um because dartmoor is a huge area um and prince town is about 20 miles inside the moor um so if you're on foot it's a it's a bit of a mission and there's only about three roads that take you out of dartmoor uh, from from princetown where the where the prison is one of those roads if you head east um, will eventually take you to exeter and the other two roads either end up at plymouth or tavistock quite quickly and you know these are long winding roads and it's very easy to be caught um the alternative is to head kind of north or south across the moor um, but unless you know where you're going, you're going to quickly find yourself cold, wet and fucking stuck. Um, so, uh, yeah, these lads uh, were local lads and they got they got caught eventually, um, sort of back in Plymouth. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was uh, an escape attempt when I was there. So I've, I've talked before about um, trying to escape from Exeter when I was looking at a life sentence. And I'd made a plan and it was legit and everything. I was, I was going to pay someone money to uh, come and help me break out. Um but uh, yeah, I never actually executed the plan because I didn't get the life sentence. I didn't need to. But it was uh, it's not unbelievable that people do still escape from prison. 
Um, so I've looked up other people who have escaped from prison before, especially Dartmoor Prison, and I thought I'd tell you some of their stories today. Now, probably one of the most famous escapes um, was by one of the Craze uh, associates, a man called Frank Mitchell, a.k.a. the Mad Axeman. Uh, Frank Mitchell, who had earned his Mad Axeman moniker after holding an elderly couple hostage with an axe, was sent to HMP Dartmoor for life. Despite his fearsome reputation and propensity for extreme violence, he was spirited off to the moor 50 years ago, um, but would never be seen again. His disappearance, with the help of Ronnie and Reggie Cray, would spark the country's biggest ever manhunt, with 200 policemen, 100 Royal Marines, and an Air Force helicopter searching the moors. Mitchell escaped on December 12th, 1966, while repairing a fence on the firing range at Bagator with a few fellow prisoners. Supervised by just one prison officer, Mitchell walked off with the pretext of feeding some of the Darmal ponies. In fact, he was picked up by two men near Princetown, and by the time the police were checking the road from Dartmoor, he was eating steak in an East London flat. It would be the last time Mitchell, who would have never seen Christmas, um, was ever seen again. His body's never been found. Officially, Mitchell is still on the run from Dartmoor, making him the longest ever escapee from the 20th century, but it's more likely he was killed as part of a gangland feud, and probably on the orders of the craze. Now this would have been quite easy to do because the prison farm at that time was huge. Um, it used to, if you stood at the prison, um, the the prison farm was as, as far as I could see. It was up to the horizon. Um, there's lots of reasons why it changed. Prince Prince Charles obviously changed uh, the rules and he, he put the rent up on the farm and the prison just couldn't afford it. Um, it was also coming at a time when you know the whole prison estate was reforming. Um, but yeah, there used to be a couple of hundred lads out working um, from the prison out on the moor. So it would have been really easy for him. And it would have been quite usual that a gang of lads would have only had one in, uh, one prison officer watching over them. So I've walked away plenty of times. I've been on my own outside of the prison plenty of times. I was trusted um, at one of my points on when I was uh, an inmate at Dartmoor. I was, I was trusted to go out on the farm. And I promptly abused that trust at every opportunity. <laughs> um, we never did drugs, really, because um, I knew because when you went back into the prison, you'd get drug tested. Um, but we we used to drink, and we, we at one one time we uh, we sneaked some girls up there at Christmas and things um, for a bit of a, a roll around in the bushes. Um, the girlfriend that I was seeing at the time would quite often come up, and as I was finishing work, she'd pick me up, um, and I'd go off with her for a bit of naughty fun. Um, close by to the prison um, and then I'd come back and uh, yeah no one was ever any of the wiser so it, it's not unbelievable that in the 60s um, it was even more lax and uh, yeah he could uh, he could get away let's uh, go back to the story again so Mitchell had been allowed to join prisoners working parties outside the prison um, despite the danger that he posed and the fact that he was not due to be released for many years uh, the jobs on the moor, also known as honour parties, were normally reserved for the prisoners who were shortly to be released. It turned out the prison regime was so lax uh, that Mitchell would slip away uh, to visit the lonely Elephant's Nest pub near Horndon, near Mary Tavy and the Peter Tavy Inn. Now the Peter Tavy Inn is, is not far away at all. Um, I've been there myself, so it's, uh, yeah, it's probably maybe maybe about five miles away from the prison. So still, yeah. Still not uh, not great. Amazingly, just a month before his escape, Mitchell was able to order a taxi to pick him up from the elephant's nest and take him to Tavistock. <laughs> so, you know, just like me, he was allowed out, he was trusted, and he was uh, completely completely abusing the system. I remember one time I was... Uh, we'd finished work, because I used to work on the, the Forestry Commission, which was one of the jobs that you could get when you were outside of the prison. Um, and it was a rainy day, and we'd been rained off. Uh, so I, I, you know, I knew it was going to be rained off. So I, I phoned my girlfriend at the time and I, you know, I said, look, get your ass up here. Um, you know, I'm going to be finished at lunchtime and we can spend a few hours together this afternoon. And I just got a bit lazy, really. I didn't want to really go all the way back up to Princetown. Um, so I just asked my boss if he could drop me off in Tavistock. And he got a bit suspicious about this because he, you know, he shouldn't be dropping inmates off in Tavistock. He should be, uh, you know, he should be dropping them off in uh, next to the prison. 
And I, you know, I just, I'd become so used to breaking the rules that I just thought he was going to allow me to break the rules and, and, and do that. But he didn't. And uh, <laughs> I had to get taken back to the prison. Now, he used to drop us off just outside the prison gates and then we would be trusted to walk the last little bit and, and go into the prison. Um, so as the my fellow workmates went in, it wasn't unusual that sometimes, you know, we'd be split into two gangs and I'd be off doing something while the rest of the lads would be doing something else. So as they went back into the prison, they just said I'd been off, called off on another job. And I ran off. Uh, as soon as my boss drove away, I kind of went left while they all went right and kind of made my way out towards the bus stop and, and hid in the bus stop until, uh, um, uh, you know, it is, it's, it's a small village on Dartmoor. So the bus only turns up like once an hour. So I, you know, I had some cash on me from being out of work and I jumped on the bus and then headed off into town and, uh, waited for my girlfriend at the time to come and pick me up. And we went off and, uh, you know, made merry on our time, but it was, uh, yeah, it's a freaky little, it's a freaky situation because even though you're doing something quite innocuous and, you know, not really that bad, if you get caught, you know, your whole world's going to come crashing down around you. So, yeah, it's quite funny that, you know, 40 years later, um, the prison is still allowing inmates like me to go and uh, run riot around town. Uh, the next escape attempt um, that I wanted to talk about was by a chap called Harold Rubberbones Webb. What a nickname, Rubber Bones. It's probably uh, probably to do with his escape. Um, Harold Rubber Bones Webb wriggled his way to freedom via the hot air warming ducks. He earned his nickname on November the 19th, 1951, by prizing away the floor of his cell and squeezing through the shafts and soaring through the air intake bars. Webb claimed uh, he was a track worker and joined a train at Brent Tor Station to reach Exeter. He then hitchhiked to London but Webb was recaptured in less than a week. So yeah, I'm not sure exactly what vents they're talking about. There must have been um, under underfloor vents back in the day. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't mention how he got out of the, the, the walls. Um, how, how, did, how did he get out from... You know, you might have got out of the wing by doing that, but how the fuck did he get off the, out of the walls and uh, and then make it back to the, uh, make it to the station? So yeah, it's a little bit unclear, that one. Um, but uh, yeah, fair play to him. He must have been skinny. He must have been a small man um, to do that. Another one from the 50s. Um, a chap called William Foxy Fowler. London mobster Foxy Fowler managed to escape through the toilets in the prison's museum, 1957. The museum itself says on the website they had recently been installed, but the builders neglected to fit windows on the bars. One of the country's most infamous criminals at the time he earned his nickname by his frequent escape bids. Uh, Foxy broke out of the high-security Parkhurst prison on the Isle of Wight twice. On one occasion, he stole a boat and sailed it single-handedly up the coast. <laughs> the villain was once arrested by police who discovered that he had spent the night with a certain lady of leisure, sleeping with a gun and bullets under his pillow. Wow, he sounds like quite a man. The 50s seems to be the time to escape from uh, Dartmoor if you wanted to. So far we've had, what was it, 1951, 1957, and when was the Mad Axeman? Wasn't that the 60s? 1966. So yeah, in that kind of 15-year uh, period, <laughs> they had three massive escapes. Um, who's the next one? Let's go on to uh, Charles Ruby Sparks. Cat burglar and jewel thief Charles Ruby Sparks was part of a mass escape bid under the cover of a riot started by prisoners in 1932. Inmates set fire to the jail and 30 tried to break free, but the riot was quelled by armed police, an army then based at the Crown Hill Barracks. Army deserter Sparks was serving a five-year sentence for burglary, then called housebreaking. Uh, the convicts made a concerted attack on the main gates in a bid to make a mass escape, even though several wardens armed with guns had ringed the perimeter of the jail. The prisoners had armed themselves with all sorts of weapons, but were subdued by a baton charge. He was back in the jail uh, January 1940, and at this time he did break free. In fact, it was he was at large for 170 days, making him one of the most successful escapes. Sparks supposedly earned his nickname as a teenager when he burgled a house in London's Mayfair. He grabbed a box of 40 red stones. Oh, so that would be the, the ruby thing. Uh, Sparks took them to a fence who said they were worthless pieces of glass, so he gave him... So he gave them away to his friends in Soho clubs. The next day, 
he saw in the papers that an Indian Maharaja had lost his valuable rubies worth 40,000. He was also apparently called Rubberface because of the expressions he pulled in the police mugshots. Next one is uh, John Morgan. Uh, newspapers in the 1800s were full of stories of the exploits of prisoners who had made their bid for freedom. In 1898, the tale of John Morgan um, was reported after he escaped from HMP Dartmoor. The newspaper report said that another convict escaped from uh, Dartmoor establishment on Sunday night, but was recaptured last evening um, after an exciting chase. The man, whose name was John Morgan, alias Henry Harley, was serving his third term of penal servitude, um, his last conviction being at the North London Sessions in 1894, where he was sentenced to 10 years penal servitude for larceny. What's larceny? Is that like theft? The alarm was raised at 8.40 on Sunday uh, by a couple of night watchmen in the prison who saw a couple of knotted blankets hanging out of a cell window. <laughs> Your classic uh, sort of escape picture. Um, it was found that the ventilator of the cell had been taken out, uh, as well as a pane of glass, and two iron bars broken through, probably by uh, blows with a stool, which was in the convict's cell. That would have to be some strong stool. Um, Morgan then squeezed himself through the small aperture, using his blankets as rope, reached the ground. He scaled the high boundary wall by means of a scaffold pole, um, and by the time he was missed, he'd gotten clean away from the prison. Armed search parties were sent out, and mounted men, and cyclists scoured the county in all directions. It was bright moonlight, but in spite of this, uh, the open nature of the country, Morgan managed to elude his pursuers throughout the night until the following afternoon. He was run down near Chagford, about 12 miles on the extra side of Dartmoor. Nice little place, Chagford. Um, last time I visited the moor, I went and uh, had some lunch there. Um, so yeah, he managed to get away. So, this is what I'm saying. Even if you have a good escape tent, you're unlikely uh, to get away from the moor. Um, it was, uh, it was, you know, a very difficult, very difficult place to get away from just because it's nature. Um, like I say, you've got three roads you can escape from, or, you know, you can try your luck going north or south and it's just rugged moorland. Um, so you're unlikely to, to get away anywhere. Um, when I was in Portland, um, a couple of lads tried escaping on Christmas Eve. Um, I remember sort of going past the cellar on Drake and, uh, this was what, it must've been 2001 that Christmas. And, uh, yeah, a couple of lads tried escaping from Drake. Um, they'd got hacksaw blades from the workshop they were working in and, uh, they tried cutting through the bars um, and the, the, the axe hacksaw blade had broke. So they had to steal another one. And this time they were successful getting through the bars. They had the sheets to get them down. Um, but their plan to get over the wall didn't work. So if they had a plan, it, it failed because they didn't get over the wall. Um, they ended up handing themselves into the block first thing in the morning. So, uh, yeah, they either didn't have a plan or the fucking plan didn't work. And uh, <laughs> they ended up running around inside the prison walls like rats. Um, so, yeah, that's my uh, my Dartmoor prison escape stories. Um, me, like the Mad Axeman, never actually really needed to work that hard to escape. Um, we got everything we wanted just because the uh, the prison staff used to just let us out. I um I used to say sort of jokingly to my friends that I would love to just when I used to go out for work I you know I'd come back at sort of five six o'clock and I wish there was some sort of service or facility where the staff would sort of drag you back in kicking and screaming because it was heartbreaking you know that and you know in that, you know I'm in prison but I'm basically handing myself in every day um, to continue this prison sentence but you know I'm out of it now and uh, I can look back on those memories fondly um, so yeah. Thank you very much for listening today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the story. Um, next, we'll do a William Bonney Weekly on Wednesday. And Friday, uh, we'll just, uh, you know, we'll make up some more prison stories uh, for you to listen to. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, like, subscribe, follow me on Instagram. It's William Bonney 838 um, Thank you for commenting and enjoy. <laughs>